Good evening and welcome to the local campaign Fredericton Candidates Debate. This debate is brought to you by the Fredericton Chamber of Commerce in partnership with the Daily Gleaner and Rogers TV. I'm your moderator, Tara Chislett, and we are coming to you tonight from St. Thomas University in Fredericton. Tonight's debate will see Fredericton's mayoral candidates debate the issues of the municipal election taking place on May 9, 2016. The order of the candidates for the debate has been determined by a draw prior to coming on stage tonight. Joining me are current mayor Brad Woodside and mayoral candidate Mike O'Brien. Also joining me tonight are our panelists. Please welcome Kira Clark, second vice president, the Fredericton Chamber of Commerce, and Stephen Llewellyn, the city hall reporter with the Daily Gleaner. The rules of the debate are as follows. Each candidate will begin with a 30 second introduction. The first candidate will then be posed a question from one of our panelists. The first candidate will have 60 seconds to respond to the question. The second candidate will then have 60 seconds to provide a rebuttal response. After both candidates have commented, there will be a two minute moderated debate. The moderator's job is to ensure that each candidate is permitted to comment and to keep the topic on focus with the question asked. <coughs> As we near the end of the debate, both candidates will be given 90 seconds to deliver a closing statement. We will attempt to ask as many questions as possible during tonight's broadcast. Without further ado, we will begin with the candidate introdu introductions. Mr. Woodside, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michael. Brad. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Brad Woodside. I was born and raised in Fredericton. I have spent half of my adult life in public service for the city of Fredericton. And what I'll be talking about tonight is the last eight years since I was re-elected and the progress that we made with a promise to you that that we will continue moving ahead and we will continue the progress to make this city the best that it can possibly be. Thank you. And now we'll turn it over to our mayoral candidate, uh, Michael Bryan. Good evening, everybody. Uh, bonsoir tout le monde. People ask me why I'm running. And quite simply, it's because I love this city. But I'm a bit frustrated because I know we can be better. We can be better economically. We can be better environmentally. We can be better inclusion-wise, uh, better in so many ways, and my vision is for us to realize that full potential. My credentials are that uh, eight years in the private sector and 30 years as a business, business executive, 15 years on city council, and uh, decades in community service. I have the energy, passion, and leadership skills that the mayor's office uh, deserves. And um, the, uh, the, in a, your time is up. Mr. And I'm retired and I have the time, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the first question of tonight is going to go to Steve Llewellyn and it is going to be for Brad Woodside. Okay. Thank you, Tara. Good evening, candidates. Mayor Brad Woodside, what infrastructure initiatives should the city target for its next infrastructure investments? One of the biggest issues facing this municipality and those across the country. Thank you are the infrastructure needs. Those uh, infrastructure needs that are under the ground are not what you call sexy in infrastructure. As a matter of fact, as I've said before, nobody comes up and pats me on the back and said, Brad, thanks very much for ripping up our street. But the bottom line is it has to be done and the infrastructure investment, we have put an extra 5% in public works to ensure that we do upgrade the municipal infrastructure that we have in terms of buildings. We've done a, a good job there with all of our sports and leisure complexes and of course the conference center. Uh, but those are the kinds of investments that we have to take and as well not only on top of the ground but under the ground and uh, the most important thing is is to appreciate what happens if you don't pay attention to infrastructure. It's a dollar today, it's ten dollars tomorrow. This city is in good hands and in good shape when it comes to infrastructure because over the years we've done it right. There's other places across Canada that are dumping everything into the into the oceans and into the waterways, some of the most beautiful cities in the country. What's wrong with, with, with Victoria as an example? It's a beautiful place. A lot of people say, I'd like to retire there. Well, how would you feel if you knew that they were dumping everything, that your toilet flushed out into the water? They did the same thing here in New Brunswick. We haven't done that here. We've done a good job. We paid attention to the environment at the Walkerton uh, the Walkerton Inquiry, they actually used Fredericton as an example of how to do it right. So we take pride in infrastructure renewal, we take pride in what we've done and we give full credit to our staff who are the experienced people that bring these to our attention and it may not be the best thing in, you know, in political terms but it's the right thing to do. Thank you. Turn it over to Mr. O'Brien for a rebuttal. Yeah, thank you. 
In uh, 2010, uh, when I was finance chair, we brought in the long-term fiscal plan for the city of Fredericton, which really mapped out our, our plans for expenditures and revenues over the next 20 years. And that's a long-term plan so we could budget accordingly. Now, every year it gets adjusted, of course, and then uh, in, gets retooled for the future. But that maps out exactly what we plan to do in our current year budget and what we fully intend to do the next year. So we have that all allocated. And uh, all that is done without borrowing any money. It's built into our ordinary budget. So if there's an opportunity to come along with uh, some federal gas tax money that uh, comes our way every now and then, I think the, uh, the number that we have budgeted this year is about $3 million for that. We can then advance some of the projects that we already prioritized. So again, you look at the city. It is well mapped out, it's planned, and again, every year we know what streets we want to fix, we know what water and sewer lines we want to uh, repair, we know what water and sewer lines are coming to the end of their life, and we're going to re replace those before they break. It's not like some other cities where they wait till there might be a water rupture, they dig that pipe up, and then they fix maybe 100 feet on each side of the pipe, and they call that their infrastructure renewal. We're getting ahead of the curve and repairing it before it becomes as it was said, you spend a dollar an hour or two or three dollars tomorrow. So we're doing that all planned. And uh, so the priority is, is already set. It's locked in every year in the budget time. It's reviewed every year and, and retooled. So we don't have to panic. It's planned, it's orchestrated, and it's well managed. Okay. And we'll move into the debate portion of the question. Um, we've got three minutes on the clock. <laughs> <laughs> well, are you, are you, we're on this point? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I'll, uh, I agree with everything he just said. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, that's a problem when you have two guys that are friends running against each other that have been on the same team for 15 years. I can't be too critical of him because I'm on his team. He can't be very critical of me because he's on my team. We've worked together. so. It's great that we were able to answer those questions and he had another two minutes because a lot of the things he said is what I agree with yeah. because that's what we put together as a team. Yeah. Well done, Michael. Well, thank you. <laughs> the uh, the, uh, the long-term fiscal plan, that was a large, we were only the second city in Canada. I think Calgary might have been a um, half a year ahead of us to put this asset management plan, plan together so we know the value of every asset that we have. And also, if that's the case, if you know what it's worth, you know what you haven't spent on it to keep it up to its value. So we were only the second city in Canada to do that, the first in Eastern Canada by far. And that puts us in this envious position to be able to sit down at budget time and our staff come forward and say, here's the plan that you approved six years ago and here's how we're going to spend the money. Because you told us that you, we have X amount of million this to spend and here's, here, here's how it's prioritized on roads, street, equipment, buildings, computers, parks, whatever. So uh, that is the type of organization that we have and uh, that's what we did at our finance, uh, 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 finance uh, committee and uh, it's, it's paying dividends to you as taxpayers because it allows us to spend at the right thing at the right time at, at the right amount and, and be very protective of the tax rate of the city of Fredericton so that we don't have to increase taxes because we're spending your money wisely. Probably the most agreeable debate you're gonna see all night. <laughs> I agree with that too. <laughs> <laughs> we'll move on to the next question. That comes from Keir Clark and it is for Mr. O'Brien. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. O'Brien, what specifically will you do to prevent the forecasted rising s city staff salaries outpacing the rising city revenues, which will put the city in a deficit position by 2019. We have two minutes or one minute? Two? I'm gonna have to double check that. It's one minute. Okay, one minute, okay. It's giving us two. First of all, <laughs> um, I'll be bold enough to say we will not run a deficit. The city is mandated not to run a deficit. Uh, I've been there 15 years, we will not run a deficit. Having said that, again, we'll go back to our long-term fiscal plan. That gives us a roadmap every year on what we think our expenditures will be and what our revenues will be. We, we plan out what we think our building growth will be and our, and our tax base increase or if it's flat. So we will be able to adapt and be nimble in our plan so that if cost, I know a, a month or so ago at a finance committee meeting one of the finance staff gave a report that did say if things didn't change by 2019 we could, be, could expect to be in a deficit position. But that is three years away. This council and as long as I'm there, we'll be responsive and move money around if we have to. Uh, you, could, you could lessen your spend on a, a projected capital project two years down the road, 
to uh, offset that. Uh, we treat our, our staff fairly at the city. We're very proud of that. They make us look good. They will. Okay. Yeah. It's a it's a very uh, interesting question, and I did read the report and uh, saw what the analysis was. But it's very easy for either one of us to promise there's not going to be a deficit because legally we can't carry a deficit, and and that's a good thing because that would make us the same as provincial and federal governments, which are messed up because they've spent more than they've brought in. That's not what the municipality does and how we operate. When it comes to our staff and the projections from 19, we're smart enough in this city to be able to take efficiencies as we're doing now in Lean Six to save money, but it's not gonna be in the backs of our employees. There was no layoffs, no reduction in service. We can do this and our employees, unlike the provincial employees, ha have been treated fairly. They've been given wage negotiations and wage increases that just keeps them their heads above water. The province hasn't given any increases to their employees. I'm not sure what an employee would feel like if they were under in, in those circumstances in a situation. Our people are our greatest asset. We ro reward them accordingly, and that's how this uh, operation works. Hi, Mr. Woodside. You're welcome. We are going to move into the yeah. moderated debate portion of that. We'll our, start. our Lean Six uh, <laughs> process uh, that came in again four or five years ago that uh, in 2010, um, has saved us now because of the diligence of our staff and the oversight of council, $6.5 million a year annually in our operating, general operating budget. And that is, that is money that uh, we're still delivering the same service, sometimes better, for less money. And those are efficiencies that were gained. There, we have a gap of about $1.2 million that we have to close between now and 2019. That's the issue you're talking about, the, salary, uh, the uh, salaries. $1.2 million. That's about five more pounds to go if you're on the diet. And again, our, our lean program, our staff will find the efficiencies to offset that anticipated cost to, off to, uh, to negate that. Having said that, we have to be diligent going forward, obviously, with uh, salary increases. Um, you know, it's uh, the biggest part, portion of any uh, company's budget, ours included. So. You know, there isn't, <coughs> there isn't a city in this, in this province that can take a hit of six and a half million dollars, a 75% reduction from the provincial government in the unconditional grant and recover that from internal services without laying anybody off, without reducing the services, as Mike said, sometimes getting better. If you're asking your employees to work that diligently, and this is happening from the bottom up to the top, mm -hmm. if you're asking them to do that and to save the taxpayers money, then when it comes time for an increase, it should be reasonable, it should be fair, and it should be equitable. Either that, or you're going to have your employees who are working at the bottom level saying, why should I go the extra mile? Mm -hmm. and why should I have to work extra hard to make you look good? You know what? They're making the city look good. They're being treated fairly, and that's how this organization will continue to work in the future. And the taxpayers are the beneficiaries. We had a national conference on Lean Six Sigma. We are leading the entire country. Yeah in doing this program. And now people are starting to pay attention and saying, wow, how can they save that kind of money without disrupting the entire organization? That's because our employees have bought into it, our employees are making it work, and the elected people are, are, are charting the course to save an additional one and a half million dollars, unheard of. When we brought in the, uh, the Lean Six Sigma, uh, I was trained in that early, early in my career right out of the university. And uh, I, was, I happened to be the finance chair at that time, and there was some resistance. There was some resistance on council, there, there was some resistance on staff, because it was new. Uh, the, the year that we brought it in, I mentored a lot of the staff as they, they, uh, as they bought into the process. And now, as Brad said, uh, they've taken ownership, which is the best way to make it deliver, because now the staff own that file, and they're proud of it. And it started with our own uh, city administrator becoming a black belt, so that he could, uh, he could walk the walk and lead the way, and it's not dictated from the top. And that's time on that, gentlemen, Kay. thank you. <laughs> Next question is also uh, Keir Clark, and it is for Mr. Woodside. Mr. Woodside, what specific initiatives could the Fredericton City Council initiate to retain a higher proportion of post-secondary students, immigrants, and other newcomers? That's a $64 million question, and uh, let me answer it by saying this. I think as a municipality, the best that we can do here is to create an environment that is conducive for people wanting to do business here, wanting to live here, wanting to raise a family here. And uh, there are people moving all over the place. There's no doubt about that. 
uh, with the recent announcement, and I give credit to the provincial government, not me, the provincial government recently with cybersecurity announced 100 jobs for Fredericton. You know, being a smart city, that's very important to us. That's 100 positions that we didn't have before they made the announcement. It's those kinds of positions attached to the University of New Brunswick, which is the greatest asset that we have, to be able to provide the, the knowledge and the brain power to take it out to private sector and put it to market. It's happened a couple of times with two companies in Fredericton being sold for a half a billion dollars. So we continue to be vigilant and we continue to provide the environment conducive to do business and to live. And I think we're doing a good job. This community is awesome. We're going to turn it over to Mr. O'Brien now for a rebuttal. Yeah, thank you. The, uh, uh, if, if, for, if you're talking about new Canadians uh, on the immigration file, we have to position, we have to work very hard with the province to make sure that they advocate to the federal government that we can be an immigration-centric center uh, for Canada right here to bring in the, the, uh, the, the newcomers to our community to invest. We have to uh, make sure that the, the, uh, the immigration file is refined so that, that when newcomers are coming here, they're uh, better prepared language-wise and they're also business-focused. And we have to roll our carpet out here to show that the city of Fredericton and the greater Fredericton area welcomes individuals and we, we really respect the fact that they're here to invest in our community. As far as economic development, creating jobs, I've knocked on close to 5,000 doors so far in this campaign. And I'm so, the, one of the number one things, other than taxes, is jobs. And they, they look at the city, uh, what, what can you do? Well, we have to be focused completely all the time on creating that environment to create new jobs. Good timing. Yeah. We're going to move into the moderated debate portion for that question. Is there a portion to this thing? Oh, we don't get a rebuttal on this You part? can rebut in the debate. I don't want to rebut him, but I wanted to make a very valid point yeah. on, on immigration. You could make it in the yeah. debate if you'd okay. like. Okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. So we're going yeah. in? Yeah. The, uh, we have to be also be able to, uh, from economic developers perspective, we have to really uh, be champions for some of the existing businesses that are here. Um, I'm gonna, uh, the, uh, the, the University of New Brunswick, the TME Center, so they're doing wonderful things there in training new entrepreneurs. I understand that uh, the University of New Brunswick has close to 30 patents that they can't get to market. Well, we have to work with the province and the federal government to find ways to get investors and a COA money to get that to market. The Stan Cassidy Research Center, uh, not only do they do wonderful work for their patients, they've developed new technologies there that are patentable. So how can we as a municipality be the champion to make those things happen? That's another way to help drive the economy outside of what the wonderful work that Ignite Fredericton's doing, mentoring and fostering new, uh, new businesses, but also creating, uh, taking the existing businesses, helping them grow and to help them to export their, uh, take their product to market. I wanted to uh, just uh, uh, focus a little bit on the immigration question that, the, uh, that you asked. And it, it's obvious, according to the newspaper, that we're both very supportive of immigration, but we have a problem, and we don't like to talk about it. This week, I had a lady in my office. She's been in Fredericton for 10 years. She's a physician, and she can't get a job. And I'm surprised that she stayed here. I had another lady in my office. She was a dentist. She can't get work. She can't get the proper training. She keeps getting bumped all the time. Her father was with her. He's a dentist. They're from Iran. You know what? It's one thing to say to people, we're going to open our doors and invite you here and bring you here, but you don't want people with a PhD driving a taxi. Mm -hmm. It's not fair. You know what? We need doctors. I've got one. Been in my office a number of times. I'm trying to help her. She's not getting any assistance from the government. I've written the ministers. I've written the, I've written the health society. I've written everybody. Yeah. I said, why is it we need doctors and I have one and you're not taking advantage of it? Yeah. So you know something? It's very important that we look after people that come here, but those with a specific skill, we're not accommodating. We're not helping. And you know what? Sooner or later, this lady and her husband, who have been here for 10 years, are going to go to Toronto. Yeah. They'll be gainfully yeah. employed and serving up there because we, as a, as a province, did not yeah. put the, the necessary uh, things in place the to be able to do that. The attraction is easy, the retention is hard. Exactly, exactly. But out of this debate, that's one thing I'd like to do for this lady. Get her in the paper, Hi. get her name out there. All right. Uh, Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> Thanks, gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Next question is from Steve Llewellyn, and it is for Mr. O'Brien. Thanks, Tara. Uh, Mr. O'Brien, what specific policy decisions should the City of Fredericton make to support local businesses and economic development? To support economic development. I think we have to be... Ignite Fredericton was created a few years ago 
out of the ashes of the Enterprise Fredericton. And the uh, City of Fredericton is the number one funder of that. And uh, they've been doing wonderful work, as I mentioned just a bit earlier, on helping new businesses uh, in IT and startups uh, uh, be created and mentor them along. We uh, put some funding into that, or we're the number one funder. We have to really consider if we can put additional funding into that so that they can take it to the new level, which, as I mentioned, is they want to now take existing businesses, help them grow, and help them take their product to market. But we, we can't be reliant all the time, though, on the white-collar industry that we have. Ignite Fredericton was created for that very reason. But the government's downsizing. The hospitals are stressed. The universities are stressed. And if we sit back and just be complacent that all those jobs will be here 10 years from now without being proactive, I think we'll scratch our head and say, what happened? We have to look at uh, diversifying our economy with renewable energy strategy, which, which we brought in this year. And, and time, Mr. Okay. O'Brien. Yep. We'll turn it over to Mr. Winslow. If you're sitting around the council table, uh, table for the next 10 years and being complacent and not caring, you shouldn't be sitting at the council table. Ladies and gentlemen, let me just say this, which addresses the question, what would you do to further business in the community? KPMG, just the last few weeks, came out and they proclaimed Fredericton is the best place in Canada to, to do business. I think we're doing something right. And if people are looking across the country on where they want to re relocate, and if location, lo location is not the most important thing, they're going to have a look at us because other people are saying we're doing it right. Other people are saying we're number one. Doesn't get much better than that. I'll use that to promote to other businesses to bring them here. And of course, you have to pay attention to local business. That's where it starts. And uh, they deserve the attention and respect as well. Thank you. We'll move into the debate portion of that, the open discussion on that matter. Uh, I don't disagree with the, uh, the, the KPMG report. But again, that's based on data from, say, the last year, which is, you know, uh, again, a team effort, and we're very proud of that. But again, we have to be focused on the future. If we just go with our past accolades, uh, again, I, I, I know for a fact that we'll be sitting there and things will move past us. We have a great, we have a great, uh, uh, we have a great staff that works on those type of things all the time. But you need leadership all the time to be focused on the file moving forward. I talked about diversifying our economy. There's other effects. We only have less than 5% of our population here that works in uh, non-traditional white-collar jobs. What can we do to create jobs for the people that are not engineers like myself or IT-related people? There has to be other ways. Our commercial parks is one opportunity. We price our land too high right now, so people don't want to relocate there. We have to come up with a strategy to try to market that. We, we're the, every truck that rolls into the, uh, the Maritimes has to come through New, uh, Fredericton first. There has to be a way to develop a strategy. I don't want to cut you off there, okay. but we want to give Mr. To Woodside a chance to respond as well. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate that yeah. KPMG in the last six months yeah. did this report. Yeah. I appreciate it just came out three weeks ago. Yeah. But that's something to cheer, cheerlead about. I mean, that's big news. I mean, if you live in Fredericton and somebody says the national organization said you're number one for business, I'm going to use it. Mm -hmm. And I'll be using it for the next 12 months. Mm -hmm. uh, with respect to the ideas that you're coming up with now, Mike, you've been, you've been with me for 15 years. Yeah. What you're talking about tonight, because you want to be mayor, you could have suggested that six months ago, a year ago, two years ago. People on the council are the ones that contribute the ideas yeah. that make the team work and make yeah. us all look good. Yeah. You know, anybody that has an idea, if you're around the council chamber, you don't have to be a mayor. Bring your idea forward. If you're passionate and you believe in it, council will advance it forward. Part of the reasons is that running for mayor is when I was a councillor, you're part-time. I've been able to focus my efforts since I retired on things that we have to look at in the future, and that's the vision I'll be bringing to the city. So. Getting back to the part-time, yeah. that's an argument from 100... Uh, that's, that's an argument from 100 years ago. Yeah. I, I, I don't know what you call full-time, I don't know what you call part-time, but I can tell you something, I don't work at anything else, I don't do anything else, I am a full-time mayor, and it's seven days a week. Mm -hmm. You just have to look at the calendar. So the full-time, part-time thing, that's an argument from another era. You can't have a part-time mayor here doing another job like they do in Moncton or mm -hmm. St. John. <laughs> okay. Anything else to add on that? Hmm? Anything else you want to add? Uh, no, uh, that's, uh, I think that speaks for itself. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> the next question is going to come from Steve Llewellyn, and it's going to go to Brad. Thank you, Tara. Uh, Mayor Woodside, how would you manage the city to avoid controversy and scandals with taxpayers' money like the IROC lease, the McLean Sports land expropriation, and the theft of money at the Transit Department? Is that for me or Mike? That's for you. <laughs> The, uh, the IROC 
a decision that was made by council was made for this reason. We were given police intelligence that there were undesirables that were looking for a license that had that license attached to it. It was a very simple decision for us. We have a wonderful, beautiful downtown. And in a heartbeat, that could turn around with undesirables that are selling, dispensing drugs and prostitution and all. And that's what we were told. That's who's knocking on our door. I uh, did talk to the minister, Stephen Horseman, during this whole debate, and I took it to council. I had, I had the, 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 the minister saying that he would not approve that. Nevertheless, we were behind closed doors getting a legal opinion, and I said to council, I said, I have talked to the minister. Here's the correspondence. I've got it today. You don't have to spend all this money on a lease because it's going to go nowhere. They asked and the lawyer, time, Mr. Woodside. and the lawyer said, yeah. A deal is yeah, a deal. We're turning yeah. it over to Mr. O'Brien for yeah, the rebuttal. The Iraq one is, uh, was well explained there. Uh, however, there was confusion at the end because you thought you had a deal, but we really didn't have a deal. And uh, so I went to the media. We were going to have a special meeting to solve it. And then when we came to the meeting, we weren't able to solve it. Uh, on, the, on the McLean Sport one, uh, again, there was a, uh, um, a, a proper procedure was followed at the beginning. Uh, uh, expropriation is always a hard topic. But it, it went... Uh, it went off the rail somehow. Uh, I think what happens to happen in a case like that, the consistent person on the file, on uh, the way I would do it if I was in the mayor's chair, is that you're the person that has to be uh, leading those key files and getting the updates and bringing them back to council. And there was a period there of about 18 months where there was no report back to council, and that's when things went off the rail. Uh, so I think we have to be more diligent working those files and keeping in uh, keeping council informed on those. Um, the uh, the scandal, uh, as you called it, uh, Steve, with the uh, with the, th the theft of money, uh, that was a very unfortunate situation. We're at for that time, okay. but we can continue in the open debate, okay. which is what we move to now. Well, that the um, that was an unfortunate one. Uh, the, the issue there was that uh, you know uh, there was some compassion shown by Brad and the city administrator uh, when they when they met with the individual, but we weren't informed until after the fact uh, about what the what the option was or what the proposal was to the individual. So council in its council makes the decision, so perhaps council should have been informed ahead of time what uh, the intended pr process would be. Council may have agreed, they may not have. So. Mr. Woodside? I think the best uh, advice that I could give to uh, any future uh, mayors is stay out of court. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not the place to be. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> We're not lawyers. We get advice. I don't like the advice. Yeah. Sometimes. And I don't have a whole lot of love for lawyers, and that's probably a, a demographic I'm going to lose. But you know what? <laughs> they have a job to do, and they make money. I just yeah. don't want them using taxpayers' money. So the yeah. best place for us is out of a court yeah. of law. Yeah. That's right. Uh, and I agree. And that's why, uh, that's why we must, as mayor, uh, yourself or myself, we must be on top of those big, potentially costly, controversial files even closer. Uh, it's not good enough to be able to leave it to a... Uh, uh, to, be lay, to, to leave it to a staff person to do negotiations and wait for a year, a year and a half for an update back to council. We have to be on top of those files. So I asked so. for a special yeah. report yeah. at the conclusion because mm -hmm. obviously it was a mess. Yeah. That's what we said. Yeah. We had the report done. There were necessary steps that were taken. People, to a degree, were disciplined. Things changed. And we learned from their mistakes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've got a pretty good record. Is it perfect? No. Mm -hmm and you can bring these things up, we have to defend it, but if we did, if we did uh, not do a proper job, we should admit that too. And I'll tell you something, I don't really care a whole lot about doing this sort of thing in the future. So if anybody is, is looking to do that, they're going to have a tough job getting through council and, de and defining exactly what they want, what the cost is going to be, and how they're treating the person they're taking the land from. This is not a good example of how that should have been done. And we're at time. Yeah. Next question is from Kira Clark, and it is to Mr. O'Brien. Thank you, Tara. Mr. O'Brien, how can you make green initiatives economically viable in the city? Um, renewable energy strategy is uh, something that we're working on this year. We're going to put a, a, a community plan together. We're going to consult the experts. We're going to consult the community where they would like us to go. And they're going to tell them the pros and the cons, things that would work, what paybacks could be, whether it's solar, 
uh, or uh, biomass. Uh, we have a, a lot of existing technology here that we can tap into. I already talked to people, local business people, that would like to uh, uh, work on, a, so on a, a community project to put a solar array in and invest their money here instead of having all their RSP money going out to uh, Europe. They'd like to invest at a lower return here. Uh, there's also stuff like uh, uh, recycling. Uh, the recycling costs money. But there's other communities that are do our size that are doing it. I'll, I'll use Guelph, Ontario for an example. They took a target of trying to have 50% uh, diverted materials from the landfill within 20 years. Within six years, they're up to 40%. And you know what? They're doing it, from what I understand it, not much more cost. So that is environmentally uh, proper thing to do, and I'm going to learn how they did it. And we're at time. Heading I, over uh, to Mr. Whitsabry, brother. My leadership here, uh, when I was to do the State of the City Address with 27 typewritten pages on everything that the city does, I set it aside, and I stood up and I spoke from the heart on the environment to engage the public, to do something, to do our part. One individual makes a difference when you're trying to make a difference in the world. I was absolutely flabbergasted at how the community engaged in what I was asking them to do. We're the first city in Canada to hire a climate change coordinator. We did green shops, we did green matters. We were one of three municipalities in all of Canada to reduce our greenhouse gases both from the commercial and residential sector. Only three reached those five milestones. I'm very proud of what we've been able to do, and I, I, I would suggest to you when it comes to the environment and looking a, a long ways out, there's a whole lot more to do. It's an evolutionary process, and it begins with getting rid of the tar sands. Then you can make some progress. All right, we'll move into the open discussion on that topic. We've engaged at the city, the, uh, I made reference to the University of New Brunswick TME program. Uh, we've engaged some students there. They just presented a report I went to listen to a month ago on uh, taking the, um, the field house, on the National Access field house, and putting uh, solar arrays on that and, uh, and, uh, and, and seeing if they can do it. Now, they've modeled it different. They, they have now got, uh, it, it's typical technology for that is about 13 to 14 year payback. They're now thinking they can do it in seven to eight to nine years payback. Now, that is because new technology is there and software that can connect all the systems better and drive efficiency. So in our own backyard, we have students that are going to come up with the ability or the, re the way that we can move forward on green technology and get that payback down to a six or seven or eight year payback, which then makes complete sense to do because that's savings in your pocket every year after that. So. There's a lot of discussion right now about pipelines, mm -hmm. and that's fair. It has sort of crept into the election campaign. Yeah. I think it's very important that the public knows that you have two candidates side by side that support the pipeline. That's important. This is not an issue between him and I, and we agree for the same reasons as was evidenced in the letter. It wasn't an open letter to the Prime Minister saying, yes, do this. It says, if you are going to, this is what you must do. That's how both of us feel about this. And if you don't look after it, in a, a meaningful way and do due diligence, you're going to have problems. But folks, right now we've got 1,700 rail cars and trucks on our highways hauling oil. Yep. If I just asked you individually out of politics, which do you think is safer? Which is the lesser of two evils? The fact is, with the tar sands, they're going to get their product to market and they're going to move it some way, somehow, and that, that's what's going to happen. The best thing we can do as a public is ensure that they do it safely, they do it the right way, and we don't have the problems that they have in other places with rail and trucks. Yep. Yep. And we can lead the way here by putting down the marker, say, with our renewable energy strategy, transi transitioning the city towards a less uh, lowering our carbon footprint. Uh, we can then position ourselves to be, take advantage of a lot of the federal infrastructure money that the Liberal government wants to spend on those type of projects. So we can start to move the ball downfield. We can start to create jobs in that economy and uh, that don't exist now. We can foster more research out of the university and we can reduce our reliance on fossil fuels and eventually move towards eliminating that pipeline. So and we are at time yeah. for that. Yeah. Next question also comes from Keir Clark and it is for Mr. Woodside. Mr. Woodside, how can the city's public transit system be improved? And the second part to that question is, can we afford Sunday bus service? Mike and I have debated this as well, and it's great to see there's a difference between the candidates. Mike said no, he doesn't support Sunday bus service, nor do I. Here's the question. You support it now? No, no, I said I, I want to move towards Sunday bus service. I didn't support it this year. What year do you support it? Uh, when we can afford it. <laughs> Soon. Sooner than later. Sooner than later. Sooner than later. Mr. Woodside. Anyway, here's how I spoke on the CBC and I haven't changed my mind on it. I said this to John McDermott. This is not a secret. 
I mentioned this four years ago when people asked about transit. This is not a secret. Well, I can tell you in the last four years we have failed. But I know why. And I said to our Transportation Committee Chairman, I figured this out. You want Sunday service? You want better frequency? You want more buses? You want north, south, east, west? Then get off your wallet. Simple as that. We can do it. We can give you Cadillac service, but you're going to pay for it. And it's very, very expensive. Mike, we figured out, I think you said, Sunday service is about a million right. bucks. Time yeah. and turning it over to Mr. O'Brien for rebuttal. Again, you knock on 5,000 doors, you find out what's important to the city. Uh, there's people in this community want Sunday bus service. They want improved Sunday uh, bus service. I ran for city council in 15 years ago because they cut my bus line out. And I wanted to find out why. When people do things to me, I want to find out why. And sure, I got in, I found out it's an expensive service to operate. But there's, we have to be more proactive. We can be more proactive. We have to negotiate with the University of New Brunswick to give you a universal bus pass and bring more money. And we're that close to it. So what do we have to move to move the ball down to get them on and bring millions into our system and more ridership? How can we work with large employers to uh, incent them to uh, buy a bus pass for their employees, say, for the first year, and encourage them to become used, uh, used to the system. I have a friend that's in the audience here that just moved back from Luxembourg. In Luxembourg, they give all new residents a bus pass for a year to get them hooked on the system. Maybe we can do it for three months, and you get more people in, more ridership, and then you can improve it. And we're at time for answers. We'll move into the open discussion. The open discussion is we have been on the same team for 15 yeah. years, and when it comes to transit, we have failed. Neither one of us is going to stand up and say it's, it's a lot better service. So it, it begs the question, how do you make it better? What we have to do with all of the things that are being requested and asked for, which are important, we have to put down a dollar figure. The entire community has to know what that is. The uh, uh, amount of money we subsidize right now, about 46%, somewhere around there. 40%. So maybe you want 60%, 65%. Maybe you want an increase in taxes. What I'm telling you, the only way this is going to be fixed is not with words, it's with money. If you've got a candidate that's going to stand here and say, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to convince council to do it, and here's what it's going to cost you, this problem is over. But if we just stand up like every election and talk about it, like something's going to happen to transform it. We've been working with the university for years. We've encouraged people and businesses to use buses. We went to the north side and talked to the business about get your customers to use it. I don't know where you Can live, I but after 6 o'clock at night, yeah. I there, see Mr. nobody Woodside, on buses. There, Mr. Woodside, to throw to Mr. O'Brien. Yeah. Sure. We have talked to the university for years, but uh, we're going to talk again because it's just too important. When people are telling me that they, this is important to them, there's a lot of younger, uh, the millennial crowd, they don't want a car. It's a lifestyle thing for them. Uh, there's also better uh, reasons to take more people to get uh, on the bus because we just get more cards off the road so we don't have to be so car centric. But there are many people in this community, I'm heavily involved in the affordable fi housing file and socialism, there's many of these people in this community cannot afford it. It's their only means of trans transport. We had, when we put Sunday shopping in, in the city years ago, uh, the statistic was there was three or three and a half thousand people already working before we did that in the, uh, in the hospitality sector on a Sunday with no bus service. So yes, it's going to cost money. But we have to be very creative in trying to find new ways to bring in revenue and entice more riders to bring revenue in and maybe we can make it fairly cost neutral. But we have to work on it and as, and if, if I've, as mayor, I'll, that's going to be a priority of mine because people have told me they want and to make it a priority. we are at yep. time for that. Yep. Thank you, gentlemen. The next question comes from Steve Llewellyn and goes to Mr. O'Brien. Thank you, Tara. Uh, Mr. O'Brien, how much do you think has urban sprawl contributed to increasing property tax bills inside the city? And what can be done to ensure all users of city services pay their fair share? I can't give you a dollar amount, Steve, but yes, it's, it's certainly impacted. Uh, when the, um, when there's, uh, the, the, the province allows ribbon development outside the city because of an unfair tax regime, uh, it's very enticing for somebody to move a business outside or build a house outside, even if they have to travel into the city and use our services, or uh, pay for water and, uh, water testing, uh, the cost might not be that much different, but the, 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 the taxes that they pay is heavily subsidized by the taxpayers of Fredericton, as the commercial tax rates that the businesses in Fredericton pay goes to the province, and it comes back to us in an unconditional grant. But we only get a pittance back, and a lot of our tax money goes to Moncton and St. John and other communities, it also goes to allow people to live just outside our borders at a cheaper tax rate, because we're subsidizing that. Now, they're coming into our city, and we want them to. We want them to work, play, and, and have fun here. But 
uh, it, you can live wherever you want, but the tax regime has to change so that it, it makes it more equitable for them. If they're going to live outside, you have to pay for the and services. And we are at okay. time. We're going to turn it over to Mr. Woodside okay. for rebuttal. I think uh, back a few elections ago, there was a very derogatory comment made about the folks in New Maryland. I don't want to repeat it, but that's the kind of attitude that we don't need. Uh, the people that live in New Maryland and live in Oromocto are friends and neighbors. They are not there because they're trying to do something to harm us. Yeah. They had that option, they had that choice, they wanted the larger lot, but what comes with that is no regulation. You don't have the same regulation, so of course you get a better tax rate. The example of the guy that calls from New Maryland and says, Brad, this dog next door is driving me crazy, what do I do? I said, move into the city. Yeah. Yeah. But the fact is they don't have the same controls out there. And yeah. when we talk about amalgamation, that's the last thing. I've addressed that today in the paper. I'm not in favor of that because the people of this city will inherit the problems outside the city and then have to fix them. And that's not fair to the taxpayers here. So we've been fighting this thing for years with every, every government that has come into power, that they're making a mistake. I, pres I proposed that I got five seconds, so I'll wait until the debate. <laughs> <laughs> Two, one. Yeah. Well, we'll move into the yeah. open debate Okay, then. so yeah. I suggested years ago, and I, I discovered this in Europe, it's called the bullseye approach to taxation. And it was so simple, it made sense, it was so simple. And it was so simple, I thought the government's not going to get this. But with the bullseye, if you can imagine what it looks like, in the very center is the city of Fredericton. The next ring that goes around is New Maryland and Oromocto. And then you get out to Minto and Chipman and Napadogan and whatever. And the further you are from the center of the bullseye, the, the, the least amount of tax you pay. But it's, it, it's, it's higher in the first ring. And what that does is it discourages people from getting right on the line and, and enjoying all of the, the benefits of a tax-paying citizen of Fredericton without having to pay the taxes. But that had no traction. It got nowhere. So we're still in a situation where this province has so many municipalities and uh, it's unruly. They haven't uh, had the intestinal fortitude to address it, so we still, uh, as municipalities, tend to flutter around until they can Mr. make a decision. We're going to give Mr. O'Brien a yeah. chance Sorry, to... New Maryland and uh, Oromocto were not the issue. It's the unincorporated areas. The uh, last report that I saw by the uh, Auditor General of New Brunswick done two or three years ago said that people in the unincorporated areas uh, that usually live just outside the city periphery are collectively are, are receiving $65 million worth of services that they're not paying for in their taxes. So uh, that is not quite fair. And it's not, it's not quite fair at all. It's not fair at all. Uh, so we have to even... We have to step our game up in uh, working with the province to try to get that changed because it just you, you can't exist that way. Uh, but it, all the people that live on the periphery, uh, they come into the city, which again we want them to. But look at the infrastructure charge uh, uh, that we have to spend to upgrade roads and streets. Uh, look at the region prospect intersection because of all the traffic that's coming in. And again, that is on the uh, that is on the city of Fredericton taxpayers' uh, dime, and uh, it's not equitable. I'm going to turn the next question over to Steve Llewellyn, and it is for Mr. Woodside. Thank you, uh, Mayor Woodside. What can the City of Fredericton do to support the expansion plans of the Fredericton Airport? You know, I negotiated the infrastructure deal with the Prime Minister and with the leader of every political party uh, to bring about this new infrastructure spending program when I was president of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. What I was told is the government wants to get in quick, they want to spend so it's really important that you have something that's shovel-ready. We've only got one thing that was shovel-ready with design done and everything. It's the Fredericton International Airport. I tweeted it out. I said, Mr. DeCourcy, we've got it all. All you have to do is tell us that we're going to get it. The airport, the last visit I was there about a month and a half ago, there was one line and there were people in that one line going to three different locations on three different flights. It's embarrassing. That airport was built a long time ago to accommodate one group of people and now we've expanded. Joanne's doing a wonderful job down there. The airport is growing, and it's growing out of its seams. There isn't anybody on council that doesn't want that expansion done and, and get the proper service into this, into this city that serves the customers that get that service every place else. So 100% in favor yeah. of that project. Turn We're going to have a hard time debating this one because, yes, we need the airport expansion. Um, <laughs> but how do we go about it? Uh, uh, again, we have a new M uh, MP here who's working diligently to try to make that happen. Uh, but for some reason, I've, I've heard that it might not meet all their criteria. Uh, I've also heard rumblings that there might be, uh, you know, uh, one of the more uh, influential uh, cabinet ministers in, in New Brunswick that may have some impact on those type of things. We have to meet with that person. We have to get, uh, I, well, let's, let's uh, um, 
the, the member from, uh, from Moncton, we have to get that person in our office and have a heart-to-heart -heart chat. What is it that, uh, what are the cr priorities, what are the criteria that has to be met? How can we, as a city and a business community, influence that decision? Is it just talk, dialogue? Is there some money that we have to put into it, which uh, we were told we didn't need it? But it's too important to our economy right now to not have that airport expansion. It also creates jobs, immediate jobs, to put people to work. So. We're at time for that. We'll move into the open discussion phase. Well, I think if the city of Moncton and the province and the federal government yeah. can spend $120, $120 million in their entertainment center, sure to, surely to God they can spend a few million dollars to upgrade an airport that serves a lot of people that mm -hmm. makes a heck of a lot more sense. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we're both agreeing on the airport. Well, thing. we're agreeing on the airport. Uh, it just uh, potentially, I don't know, uh, it's not a disagreement, but we have to move forward on uh, moving that file down. It's, uh, we need to put trades people to work. There's too many people that were in our community that were going out west to work. At least their tax money was coming back. But right now, with the downturn out west, they're back here and they're not working. We have to get people to work, and we have that shovel-ready project that is good for not only to, for people to, uh, to uh, get a paycheck, but also drives our economy. So we have to be, we have to be uh, extra due, uh, diligent on moving that file forward. And if we had a better airport and this renovation was done, we'd better be able to accommodate those that are flying out west and those that are flying home, because even they're running into problems into our airport. Mm -hmm. Thanks, gentlemen. We'll turn the next question over to Kira Clark, and it is for Mr. O'Brien. Mr. O'Brien. How has the role of mayor changed over the years, and why would you be the best mayor? I think the, uh, the role of mayor, uh, uh, this city has, uh, we had the largest growth uh, percentage-wise and number-wise in the uh, province in the last census. Uh, we grew by over 5,000 people and, and whatever the percentage was. Um, it takes a person with a lot of experience, business experience, council experience, community connections, to uh, th the day of being able to wait for people to come to you uh, to make things happen has changed. You now have to be a proactive mayor that goes after things all the time. You have to be bringing people in all the time to, uh, to uh, engage the experts, get best practices from across the country, work the political files daily if it's necessary. And uh, I have the, uh, the, uh, the private sector uh, uh, experience, I have the business executive experience, I have 15 years on council experience, and I have decades of community experience that I can bring to the file. And uh, that, I feel, and is, a, is the right combination to move we're us We're going to turn it over to Mr. Woodside for rebuttal. Very short and sweet. I have all of the credentials that he does, and when it comes to experience, a little bit more. We'd both be great mayors. Mm -hmm. So are we into yeah, the Yeah, we're going to move into the open discussion, discussion now. I don't know. I, I'll try. I'll try. I think you used like 15 I'll seconds. Yeah, I'll try. Uh, my style is that I, I'm, a, I'm a team builder. Uh, I've done that through my work career. Uh, I was very successful in my, in my uh, job with the Liquor Corporation and bring, even bringing the maritime provinces together uh, to work on a cohesive uh, supply chain strategy. Uh, the, in the community, uh, we've knocked in, uh, and that that will knock three or four million dollars out of the supply chain of just the New Brunswick Liquor Corporation. But that was a team that was assembled, and I had to lead it. On the locally uh, in the uh, community action group on homelessness, we have a collective of thirty to forty different agencies in the city that were working hard to try to move the ball down the field on the uh, on the affordable housing issue. They asked me to be their chair to bring them together and bring cohesiveness together, so that when we bring we collect get together, we stay focused on that file. And my job was to be the person that brings them together, engaged and interested people, and inspires them to do great things. And that's what my track right record on. has shown, and that's what I'll bring to the job. What Mike has done at the local level, I've done at the national level yeah. with respect to affordable housing. One of the big issues when the budget was brought down, there was an elimination of those programs. As president of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, representing municipalities across the country, we took the Prime Minister and we took the government to task. We had meeting after meeting that you can't do this. And we had it changed. So when we talk about leadership, and Mike says he's a leader, you know what? I'm like the captain of a hockey team. I may be the captain, but I want my players to score goals. At the arts and culture debate, I didn't take any credit for what we've done in the last four years. I said it was Kate Rogers who did it. Maybe that's a different style of leadership. I don't want to do it all. 
I'm not committed and I am not experienced enough to take on every file, but I find and I pick the best people to do it. Kate Rogers has put this city on the map with arts and culture. Not Mike, not me. And there's other examples of that with Eric McGarity on the Age-Friendly Committee. He heads that up. But you know what? When he's successful, we're all successful. It's a team. There's no I in team. Want Thank to you. Give Mr. Yeah. O'Brien, a chance yeah, to respond. The, 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 your your concept of mind of the team is a bit different. It, I, you just can't appoint somebody to be the arts and culture person and let that person do the arts and culture for four years in in somewhat isolation. And she's done a wonderful job. Or Eric McGarity on the age friendly stuff, or myself on the affordable housing, and John McDermott on transit. It takes anybody can appoint somebody. I can appoint somebody as well, and hopefully you appoint the right person. And then, but it takes the consistency of the mayor's position to bring that group together and say, how are you doing? Do you need my assistance? Can I bring in more resources? Uh, what, what is the, the game plan going forward? Are you feel comfortable in your mandate? Can I be of more assistance? Uh, that type of thing. That is the type of style that I would bring to it uh, and just not say that I've appointed somebody and they've done a great job. And we are at time oh, for that. Would you like me to do it, Kate? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to... We're going to move into closing statements now. You have a little bit of extra time at two minutes each, and we are going to start with Mr. Woodside. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Mike. This is certainly not a, a Trump cruise thing, and I, I'm very happy about that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is Canada, and I'm very thankful about that. This is probably one of the most difficult elections I've ever been through because Mike's a very good friend. Mike is probably one of my best friends. So when we travel to council all the time, I pick him up. We chat, we talk, and we agree on a whole lot of things. We've also agreed during those conversations that we have done an extremely good job here in Fredericton, in Atlantic Canada, and it's evidenced by all of the acclamations that we've received from other organizations, both provincially and nationally and internationally. We could do better, of course. We always can do better. You could never be in a position where you'll never do better. We strive to be the best that we can be. We have other third-party uh, organizations coming out and validating that. And when you call me a cheerleader, that's the greatest compliment you could ever pay me. Because when KPMG came out saying that we were the best, we all should be cheerleading that. The Chamber of Commerce, the business organizations, everybody who lives here can stand up and say, we're number one in the country when it comes to business. So if somebody is looking at starting a business, wouldn't you ask yourself, wow, if they're number one, how did that happen? They must be doing something right. So that's just one of the things that's happened in the last eight years. You've got, you've got your sports and leisure complexes. We've never spent any money on those before. We're not carrying debt more than we can afford. We have a debt ceiling which will never be passed under my leadership. Financially stable community, uh, which I would put up against any community in this province. We've got great staff, we've got great community vibes. That's what we have, great community vibe. You go to the coffee shop or the market, people feel good about their city. We're cleaning it up right now, it'll once again become a beautiful oasis. It'll become a garden. And we're at time. Perfect. <laughs> And we'll turn it over to Mr. Yeah. O'Brien. Look, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the Chamber and Rogers for putting this event together, and Tara for uh, moderating and keeping it fair, and Steve and Kier for your challenging questions. Um, I, I think what you've seen here tonight is, yeah, we're, we're in agreement on quite a few, quite a few issues, but I, I think it might be clear that some of our, our style is a bit different. Uh, our style is, I'm just not, uh, a mayor has to be a cheerleader, cheerleader, obviously a mayor has to be, but you have to be a team leader too. And I, I, I think that I've been able to present to you tonight, at least I hope I have, that my style is just a bit different. I, I will be a person that engages the community to try to be better. I'll try to be the a person that engages the council to be more cohesive, to try to move the ball forward and be better. I think I can, I, I'll, I'll be the person that brings the business community together closer to work even more cohesively. We have a great relationship with uh, the, 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 the major business organizations. But in the last couple of months, I've visited uh, many businesses, and they said I'm the first elected official of any stripe that's ever visited a business and asked them, how are you doing? How can, how, can we, how can the city be better? How can the city help you be better? I went to the York Health Care Center, and they're doing magical work there on uh, medications on their patients. They reduce medications to their seniors' residents by 50%. They've improved their quality of life and saved 
um, uh, in that one location alone, a half a million dollars in tax money. And they said, I said, that's wonderful. What are you doing about it? Well, what can you do? I said, we can trumpet that. Is there an economic development opportunity out of what the magical work that they're doing? The Stan Cassidy Center I visited and saw the technology that they're developing there. And, they, and I challenged them, are, have you ever tried to take that to market? No. Well, why not? Well, we don't know how to do it. Well, a, a mayor, in the, in the style that I would operate, would find a way to bring the partners together with our Ignite Fredericton and our university community, uh, culture to be able to put those together and get them to market and create jobs. So there's, uh, we agree on a lot, but our style is different, but we both love this city. Ended it right on time. Hey, perfect. That's all the time we have for tonight. Thank you for joining us. This debate has been brought to you by the Fredericton Chamber of Commerce in partnership with The Daily Gleaner and Rogers TV. Special thanks to the candidates, Mike, uh, Michael Bryan and Brad Woodside, Woodside. <laughs> <laughs> and panelists Keir Clark and Steve Llewellyn for being here, and to St. Thomas University for hosting. The New, New Brunswick Municipal Election takes place on Monday, May 9th. Please remember to get out and cast your vote. And if you need information on how to cast your vote, visit www.electionsnb.ca. Thank you and good night. Thank you.